Okay, so we are at uh, 10 01 uh, Pacific Standard Time, so that seems as good a time to, as any to uh, start. I'm using a, uh, um, a Runecaster slide uh, show today. It's got a, a bit of a different HUD, so uh, excuse me if things seem a little bit weird um, as I'm getting used to it. Um, so today I'm going to uh, try and present a uh, informal uh, discussion of some bioprocesses that use light. And the uh, title is Green and Purple. I've got green and purple things all through the talk. Uh, and uh, basically I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, two different biosystems that use green pigments and purple pigments that uh, um, end up being uh, able to harvest energy from sunlight. So yeah, there's um, all sorts of big scary molecules um, around me. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that, uh, my little friend over there um, uh, later in the, in the talk. It's, it's a, a kind of a benty chlorophyll. So um, without further ado, hey, here's an abstract. Uh, um, you know, basically, I'm going to talk about light-driven uh, bio, biological uh, processes. Uh, they are very complicated. I'm not a biochemist, so I'm going to try to uh, reduce them down to uh, very uh, simple behavior. The fundamental thing that these systems will do is that they'll uh, take in light, they'll absorb that energy, that will move some electrons around and end up moving uh, hydrogen ions, H pluses around, uh, so as to um, accomplish tasks within uh, cells. Uh, and one of these tasks is vision, uh, which plants don't have. I hope not. They don't really want them watching me too much, um, but uh, which we do. One of the things I'm struck by when we um, talk about uh, photosynthesis and uh, the similar mechanisms is just how complicated uh, many of these um, processes are. Uh, the um, structures themselves rival Rube Goldberg machines in their complexity. So we'll take a look at uh, some of them. That's, that's what I'll focus on primarily today. Okay, so what are the green and purple in the title? Well, green will be uh, photosystem uh, one and two. Let's see if I can um, add some um, animation to what's going on. Maybe not. Green. Click. Okay, so I can move around on slides, but I'm not uh, getting a uh, very quick um, uh, drawing on the slides. Okay, well, uh, talking about uh, photosystems one and two, uh, they're in plants, uh, cyanobacteria. Also, going to talk about rhodopsin uh, and uh, related species, which are in uh, bacteria. Um, let's start with the purple ones, the rhodopsins. Click. Um, talking about Rube Goldberg machines, here's a uh, sketch of one. Um, I've given the image credit um, um, below. I'm still trying to make little squares and circles and things, and it was working right before the seminar. So that's um, that's that's something that we'll have to fix. So um, there was a recent CBS story, and I can give you I can give you the um, URLs as I'm as I'm uh, uh, speaking. There you are. That was the Okay, so that's not working right either. Okay, very well. Um, there's the uh, URLs. I'll be able to um, I'll be able uh, to uh, send those uh, to people to people later. Maybe I can try one last thing. There we go. Okay, that's that's the URL for um, more of on Rube Goldberg uh, machines. Very complicated, as we say. So, uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is um, um, a uh, bacterial rhodopsin, and it comes from this uh, Halobacterium selenarium. And uh, so, the Halobacterium selenarium uh, ends up living in 
uh, very salty waters. Very salty waters. And there is an article on them at this link. Okay, that's working better. Uh, and th these are a few of the denizens that live in uh, such uh, salty waters and very salty lakes. And this little rod-shaped one that I've got the arrow pointing to is actually the um, uh, Halobacterium salinarium. Uh, this was featured as a, um, or a uh, bacteria rhodopsin uh, from this organism was featured as a um, molecule of the month uh, about a decade ago, I think, on the uh, protein database. I'll talk about that in a little uh, bit. Essentially what it does is it pumps hydrogen ions, H+, across bacterial cell membranes. And uh, the... Um, this, this action causes a pH difference inside the cell versus outside the cell. And that is what um, allows uh, a molecule called ATP to be synthesized. Okay? This ends up being a way for the cell to store energy. All right, that's a mouthful. And I'm, I'm not here to try and, and uh, be intimidating about, um, about all, of, uh, all of these structures. I will provide a direct link. We'll see. Here's a direct link to the actual page that um, I'm uh, showing you. It's uh, if you haven't seen it, the protein database has these molecules of the month, and it is a really lovely um, introduction to structural biology. Uh, and uh, they they bring it down to um, a level that even a poor inorganic chemist like myself can understand. Next slide. So um, the whole point of what the rhodopsin does is to move the uh, H plus around. Okay, so um, on one side of the cell, you've got high concentrations of H plus, right? You think of H plus as being acid. You've got uh, low concentrations of H plus on the other side of the cell because there is a um, light-driven pump that um, moves these ions. Um, as a result, this slide can happen, where on the left, I'm showing you um, adenosyl uh, ribodiphosphate. I think that's what it's called. Again, I'm not the, um, I'm not a, um, a biochemist. The point is, if you look at where I say have diphosphate labeled, there's two phosphorus atoms with a bunch of oxygen atoms. Um, there's a little enzyme in, in, uh, that spans a cell membrane uh, that will take and add to this diphosphate stuff another phosphorus atom with, with some oxygen. It takes energy to do that, but that energy can be released reversibly. So this is an energy storage, um, um, an energy storage mechanism. Okay. Um, let's see. So one can access a little bit more on that from LibreText. These are uh, open source uh, textbooks out of um, the University of California uh, system. Uh, that's where I got the um, figures from. So um, how ATP synthase works is going to be a story for another day. We're going to go back to the uh, rhodopsin. Next slide. So um, here's a structure of the um, rhodopsin from the um, um, Halobacterium salinarium. Uh, it presents as a complex of three of these of three of these um, little structures. There we go. So on this slide, on the figure in the lower right, you see three of the uh, proteins from above. Going forward, um, this is a view from the side. The rods, I'm still trying my um, pointers and stuff. Ha, ah, I have a pointer. Okay, so the rods that are showing up um, from um, 
uh, the the top and bottom of this figure that I've just put arrows on um, will uh, represent uh, the cell membrane. This thing spans a cell membrane. What are the coils? Okay, well, the coils are actually a uh, protein. Um, a protein is basically a chain of amino acids. What does that mean? Well, it's basically like one long molecule that's linked with little Lego bricks, essentially, that you can make into different shapes. Uh, there's a particular amino acid that if you repeat um, it over and over and over and over again, will turn um, into uh, this, uh, these spirals. These are structural. They're essentially the building uh, blocks of the, um, they're, they're, they're essentially to keep all of the important machinery in place. Um, they're uh, basically the building in which the uh, chemistry takes place. I've got the same structure um, lurking out behind the screen. I'm going to shrink it down and bring it, uh, bring it in front of you. Because if I don't shrink it down, it's, it's going to get kind of, Kind of big and intimidating. It's uh, almost like something from H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, let's stretch, make you a little bit smaller, and move you in front of the screen, Kachunga. And when I said a little bit smaller, I really meant just just a tiny bit smaller. Okay, so hopefully I haven't engulfed anybody. Um, in in there, okay, it looks 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 pretty good. Um, this is the same structure. Uh, essentially, what you see is the uh, pink spirals, and those um, span the cell membrane. Those are very good at keeping the um, keeping the um, uh, protein in place in a specific place in the cell. There's some. Um, uh, loose looking spaghetti ends at the top. There's some loose looking spaghetti ends at the bottom. These represent um, the protein chain that aren't spiraling. And you'll notice some blue stuff kind of hanging out in the middle. I don't know if you can zoom in on the blue stuff. These are molecules called retinol. Um, every three spirals, represents one of the uh, proteins, and these proteins always occur in trimers of three. Um, and um, each retinal molecule is the pump. So um, what happens is that the blue, like that little blue array of um, molecules inside this uh, protein gets hit by light, changes shape, and that shape change drives an H plus being moved from uh, the top of all the spirals down uh, through uh, a channel um, and um, out out the bottom. Okay, so uh, I'll show you this on I'll show you what happens on uh, the 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 slideshow screen. In the meantime, let's uh, edit this guy and move him out of the way. Oh, la, 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 la. All right, goodbye. Okay. La, 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 la. I always have stage directions on my slide. See structure model here at Science Circle. I got to do that or, or else I forget what I'm doing and go off onto tangents, start talking to you more about my cats. Um, I've got cat pictures later, of course. So here, here's um, more pictures of bacterial adoption. Remember I said Lou Goldberg machine? You would expect that the H plus kind of starts at the top and um, moves down out uh, the bottom in a logical flow. But um, there's five steps to moving the H plus. And the step one right here, right in the middle, is where that retinal molecule was. Um, uh, absorption of a photon causes retinal to change its shape, and it basically shuttles an H plus from one place to another. And in reaction to that, an H plus is kicked out at the bottom, and in reaction to that, an H plus gets sucked further in and recharges the retinal. 
followed by an H plus being sucked in from the rest of the cell. And finally, an H plus moves um, into position to be ejected when the next photon arrives. So this isn't like one, two, three, four, five in a like a logical sequence from from one um, end of the uh, structure to the other. Uh, there is a logical sequence, and all of these things um, have to happen. But it's uh, started off by the proton pumping action of uh, the retinal. Uh, hey, retinal is in your eyes. I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, okay, I actually like this uh, Lumcast uh, screen screen thingy. I like I like making arrows. There's an arrow. So what happens in the bacterial rhodopsin? Um, well, that's that's the structure of the molecule. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with organic chemistry um, jargon, I guess um, every Every, every vertex, right? So if I maybe circle one of these guys, every vertex represents a carbon atom. So the one I've just put a square around is a carbon atom. You see two lines. Well, carbons tend to have four things attached to them. You see two lines. Those are the bonds to other carbons. There's four things attached. The ones you don't see are assumed to be hydrogen. Right? So what I've just put a square around is a CH2. This guy with the next square um, has, oh, four lines. There are no hydrogens attached to that one. Okay? The places where we see two parallel lines are referred to as double bonds. And when you have a pattern of single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, then you have some electric uh, the electronic mobility through a chain. So it gives us, uh, the electron mobility gives us some special features, like having a chain that long with maybe a nitrogen at the end um, allows the molecule to um, absorb light. Um, one of the things that happens when the molecule absorbs light is that uh, the bonding becomes a bit looser. These double bonds tend to be rigid. They tend to basically keep um, the things attached to the carbon in a particular geometry. It happens to be a planar geometry. When you get into an excited state by absorbing an electron, that ends up being loosened, and you can have rotations happening. So, very simple thing, very simple molecule. Um, this uh, retinal um, derivative is not quite retinal because we've got the um, uh, it's actually attached to the uh, protein in this case, um, but it's uh, essentially the same molecule. Um, in your eye, in your eye, oh, I always forget this slide. Okay, so I, I kind of explained why does the molecule uh, change uh, shape. Um, you know, in in molecules. Uh, we've got electrons that are holding uh, nuclei together. And the electrons, where they're allowed to go, is um, determined by quantum, me quantum mechanics. Um, I, won't, I won't scare you with that. Essentially what happens is that uh, the molecules, the molecules um, arrange their electrons into uh, states where uh, you have low energy um, states and you have high energy states. Um, my oh, my squares have gone away again. Oh no, there we are. So I circled the high energy states. They're so high energy that the electrons uh, avoid them. They, there's no electrons in there until the molecule absorbs some light. H nu is light, um, and then an electron can um, show up up here, leaving a hole down there. Uh, this reduces the strength of interactions between neighboring uh, carbon atoms, and that's what lets uh, the free rotation start to happen. So uh, 
uh, orbital change reflects a change in the energy state of the electron. Absolutely, yes. Because uh, this is uh, basically the same as taking a bucket of water and climbing a hill with it. Um, you could do some work with the potential energy that you have invested in uh, the water um, in, in the bucket. Uh, I don't know, throw it at uh, someone whose uh, politics differ from yours or something like that. Um, Okay, that was meant as a joke. So, um, so in your eye, we have similar molecules. Um, here's uh, retinal. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Click. Here is retinal, um, and you know, I keep saying retinal. It's it says retinilidine. Uh, all that's happening is that we're kind of changing, kind of just changing this little uh, bit there, uh, depending on what uh, is connected to it, okay? So in your eye, in your eye, we have some recharging of the retinal that happens in the dark state. That's the stuff down here. Okay, my ability to draw comes and goes. Okay, that's that's down in the lower block and in the upper block uh, this is what happens when light absorption uh, occurs um, that bit in red is exactly what happens when light absorption occurs I'm going to uh, zoom in on it okay um, notice how we get a structure change what's the importance of the internal uh, rotation uh, so essentially, um, you move this H plus um, from one position in the protein to another position in the protein, uh, and or to another position in space, and that allows it to be transferred along a chain. Uh, in your eye, this ends up um, develop uh, developing a uh, potential that can be. Um, uh, trigger a nerve to fire. Okay, so this is what happens in the rods in your eye. This structural change uh, triggers uh, H plus flow. Since uh, H plus is a uh, charge species, movement of ion is the same thing as an electrical current. Uh, so that can um, trigger nerves to fire. And all the rest of what I had on the slide was the recharging. It takes about half an hour after this uh, structural change to occur for the compound to go uh, back. One of the things I'll um, just point out, in your eye, um, we are moving that bond, but in the bacteria rhodopsin, it's moving that um, the bond adjacent to it. Okay. And part of that is going to be determined by the space left in the protein um, and carefully managed by the protein. It's exactly like a conveyor belt. Let's see. Next slide. Click 16. Okay, so um, uh, the purple part was uh, the bacteria rhodopsin and the um, visual purple, it was called, that's in the rods of your eye. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about photosystems one and two, the green part of the title. And uh, thank you for indulging me. These are some pictures from my garden. Uh, we've got some um, purple cone flowers going on. I think uh, these are uh, some lavender and uh, some bluebells. And they just happen to be purple flowers and um, with green in the background. Uh, they, otherwise, no relevance to the talk. So thank you for your indulgence. Um, Taking a slight detour, because I am an inorganic chemist, uh, and um, we like to look at uh, biochemistry and structural biology and get inspiration for how to do things that might be useful for society. This is an early structure. We we'll call it bio-inspired inorganic uh, chemistry. It's a molecular vo uh, photovoltaic, an example from 2004. If you take um, the photosystems in, um, that, that are used for photosynthesis and distill them down to their essence. You have parts of the molecule that are antennas. 
actually in uh, photosystem one and photosystem two, as I'll show you, these molecule, the, the molecules aren't actually joined to each other. They're just in proximity held by the protein scaffolding. Um, you, so anyway, you have a um, antenna um, which helps um, photons which don't actually hit the active site, the donor, which I've circled in green here, uh, it helps channel their energy to the active site and increases the efficiency of um, absorption. Why donor? Well, um, what happens, like I described way back on the um, molecular orbital slide, what happens when a molecule absorbs light is that an energy, or is that an electron gets promoted from a low energy state to a high energy state? Most of the time, that electron just falls back into the hole it left, and the energy is released as useless heat. If you set things up right, the um, electron in the high energy state can make itself or can make its way somewhere else and be trapped there and um, avoid recombination. So it's still high energy. Oh, and there's a low energy hole. And now we've got an energy difference that can be used to drive some chemistry. Let's see, when the electron returns to the cis energy state, um, the shape returns to the cis form from the transform until it forms another photon. Is that it? So here's the thing. Um, the, um, the, the one form will turn into the different form on absorption of energy. The, um, the energy um, uh, can be transferred somewhere, somewhere else. The proton can be, um, can be uh, tr um, moved through the protein chain or whatever. Um, it does take some time for the molecule to relax back into the initial state. So in the rods in your eye, um, there's a constant a movement of the uh, retinal um, from uh, the light absorbing kind of tip of the rod back into um, the, I guess, I'm just going to call it the lower portion, where um, there are processes that actually reset the shape and manage the shape and then inject it back. So uh, it's not instant. Okay? It may take uh, 10 to uh, minutes to half an hour. Uh, sometimes photon absorption doesn't excite an electron. It can induce internal rotations and vibrations. Absolutely. Um, so um, it does depend on the wavelength of light. So usually visible light has uh, the um, enough energy to promote electrons from um, low energy states to higher energy states. But if you're looking at infrared light, uh, that tends to um, excite uh, molecular vibrations, it leaves the electrons alone, and uh, microwaves tend uh, to be appropriate for exciting rotations molecules. But yeah, all of those, all of those are like fascinating techniques. Okay, uh, let's see, back to this slide, the three things you need to uh, make photosynthesis happen are antennas, our donor sites and acceptor sites, and then some other chemistry to do some energy or do some um, um, useful work with the separated charges and their associated energy. Okay, here's an example. Um, so Dan Nocera is at Harvard and uh, he's done some lovely work. This is a paper I uh, saw last week, this, or from a paper I saw last week, from Accounts of Chem Research, and it uh, talks about some of his work for the last um, oh, 12 years. Um, the, um, it's a, on this slide, I've got one of his figures. It's a comparison between uh, natural photosynthesis and artificial photosynthesis. And as we'll see later in uh, my slides, um, there's a thing called photosystem two, there's a thing called photosystem one. Um, they both absorb energy. Photosystem two um, is where oxygen is um, evolved at uh, plants. And these things drive 
a couple of other processes that end up taking carbon dioxide and adding hydrogen to it and making uh, biomass. So the artificial photosynthesis relies on a silicon chip or a silicon wafer. Um, and uh, the silicon wafer can absorb light and cause charge separation, as I've been describing. And what the clever thing uh, they've done is uh, to put a surface on one side of the silicon chip that will um, be favorable for turning water into oxygen and H+. Uh, it happens to be a cobalt phosphate. Um, it's Oh, it's delightful because when the cell is running, it's self-healing. Um, any damage to the uh, surface actually gets repaired as part of the dynamic chemistry of the process. Uh, so it's, it's pretty much uh, got no time limits on to um, its, its lifetime. On the other side, you need H plus uh, to turn into H2. Um, there's lots of things that'll do that for you. Platinum is especially good. Uh, but anything that will turn H plus into H2 at fairly low voltages has a problem with oxygen. O2 molecules from the air can be turned into uh, reactive oxygen species related to hydrogen peroxide. Well, that's a problem because on this hydrogen side of the um, silicon wafer, you want a colony of bacteria to live. And if you're uh, generating hydrogen peroxide, uh, it kind of bleaches them into death. So the particular surface he came up with, it says, it says CO, COP, and that's confusing because the other one, other side says COP. The green side is a cobalt phosphate. It's a salt. The pink side is a cobalt phosphorus alloy. And that has the property of allowing this H plus to H2 thing to happen, but it suppresses the um, oxygen making reactive oxygen species happen. The upshot is this cell operates pretty close to its ideal value. And pretty much every photon that, I shouldn't say every photon, one out of every four photons that hits this thing, it's got 25% efficiency, um, ends up making uh, these reactions go. Who cares? Well, the bugs that are engineered um, use the um, hydrogen to um, fuel their metabolism, right? So they do, they do all the same things that the um, the by the, that a regular leaf would do. Uh, including taking carbon dioxide and turning it into uh, biomass. And they can be engineered to make methanol, ethanol, um, or uh, biopolymers that are useful. Um, th this was wonderful work. It's, it really just appeared in his last sentence, or I'm sorry, in his last paragraph in this, he said, oh, by the way, we've also engineered the... Um, We've also engineered the uh, bacteria to fix nitrogen. Uh, and, you know, the nitrogen um, containing biomass also has pulled carbon dioxide from the air. And if you spread that on, um, uh, on fields, then, um, you know, you'll enrich the soil with uh, carbon organic matter and fertilize it at the same time in what should be a um, process that depletes the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. This sounds to me like a wonderful thing, because um, as some of you know, uh, ammonia fertilizers are made by the Haber process, which requires 500 degree iron powder at, I think, 200 atmospheres or something like that. Uh, it's essentially responsible for 1% of the carbon dioxide uh, formation on this planet or commercial activity. Uh, so it's a huge contributor to um, climate change. Uh, so having, um, having uh, bionic leaves do that work for us um, without having to burn any fossil fuels to make fertilizers, uh, that would be awesome. Um, I'll remind you that without um, fertilizers, without um, the Haber process to make fertilizers, there would not be enough food to feed all the people on this planet. So 
let's see, I'm going to catch up with the feed for a sec. Uh, I, I kind of get uh, too focused on what's happening inside my head to always uh, look at the feed. So sorry about that. Um, let's see. Can't see high energy gamma rays. We will. I love that one. Um, and the alloy. Um, so it's cobalt and phosphorus as the um, alloy. I think it's a very small amount of phosphorus in uh, cobalt. They um, in in their paper they were also using a I think it's a nickel zinc tin alloy um, as well for um, that they started with but found that the cobalt phosphorus one uh, worked. And, you know, it's like steel. Um, steel is iron and carbon, but the amount of carbon in steel is really, really, really tiny, but very significant. So, uh, yes, yes, Haber process has been very important. And here's the um, here's here's the actual um, uh, reference. I'll um, copy the URL so you can read the abstract to it. And it's mostly behind a paywall. Look. Okay. Uh, and you know, if you are actually wanting some um, much better information about photosynthesis than than I'm going to provide here, um, here's here's a, a link to a beautiful paper I found. Uh, this is in uh, Journal of Chemical Education. The article itself is probably behind the paywall, but the supplementary material is not. And in the supplementary material, uh, you've got um, a zip file containing an executable file that has a, a wonderful um, um, set of um, animations that um, show dynamically how, how photosynthesis Let's see. Click. So I keep saying things about Rube Goldberg machines. Fundamentally, the photosynthesis that you're used to um, runs by something called the Z scheme. And here the Z is on its side. Uh, you know, essentially, essentially this, um, essentially that thing uh, can look like a letter Z or Z if you happen to be Canadian. Um, um, if you rotate it by 90 degrees you know, clockwise or counterclockwise. And this is actually a lovely little slide to summarize. Because what happens at one end of the process is that um, hydrogen and um, or that um, water has electrons stolen from it um, and um, is uh, turned into oxygen. That happens at a uh, manganese uh, cluster. And uh, photosystem two, paradoxically, I'm going to talk about photosystem two, two first. Photosystem two is that bit, it takes four photons and promotes four electrons to a higher energy level. And then these electrons are allowed to come down in energy. They drive some chemical reactions along the way. And then they're stored in photosystem one, which also absorbs some photons. These nice little RG biv um, H news are um, the photons. It absorbs four photons that essentially take H plus and turn it into H2. The H2 is stored in NADH, another uh, energy storage molecule, uh, short-term energy storage molecule in uh, cells. And ultimately, it's used to take carbon dioxide and turn that into carbohydrates. Turns out that CO2 to carbohydrates uh, is nearly um, uh, thermoneutral. Right, so it costs very little energy to do that, although the pathway has to be catalyzed to make it happen. So um, that's the, I like that picture. That, that gets the idea across. Here's another picture that uh, kind of tells you a little bit more detail of what's going on. Um, there's a manganese uh, part of the photosystem. Um, the um, I guess uh, electrons uh, from the water are stored at a very low energy level. Um, light promotes them up. And then, like a slinky, 
um, these um, electrons uh, cascade through a series of molecule alone or in pairs. No, just, just single electron transfers. Um, they um, uh, cascade through uh, these uh, various structures doing some work along the way, making um, ATP from ADP, things that your cells need to live, things that um, everyone's cells need to live, the ATP, uh, until they're stored at another place where they can be promoted again. And then there's a whole bunch of um, stops along the way. I'm going to show you some of these structures. OK, so here's a structure of photosystem two. Um, again, it was a molecule of the, uh, of the month um, in, I think, 2004. Um, it's a big molecule. So I'm going to show you different views of it. Click. OK, so this is from the molecule of the month uh, um, uh, page. Um, the photosystem two ends up um, being a dimeric phot protein, so it shows up as uh, dimers. It spans membranes. Okay, so one is still trying to get things to work. Eventually it will. Um, so it spans uh, the protein uh, membrane. That's this uh, gray area on the left-hand sli side of the slide. Ah, oh, there we go. There's um, a gray area. Um, there's a lot of chlorophyll molecules that uh, act as antennas and direct energy towards um, the uh, central bit. Okay, and all of this is held in place by the scaffolding of the uh, pro of the um, coils, the um, um, alpha helices. Okay, let's see. Uh, is there this? Is there evidence that in certain cases there are additional photosystems th uh, three, four, and five? There may be. There's a lot of um, structural. Um, there's a lot of structural uh, diversity in uh, photosystem one and photosystem two if you go to different organisms. Uh, but I think that the core of them involve the manganese as the oxygen uh, generating uh, center uh, and uh, the chlorophyll. And in fact, there's several different uh, types of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, there, there tend to be uh, letters. Um, so yeah. Um, you know, what I'm showing you isn't the photosystem, it is a photosystem. Let's see, so um, changing color, going over here. So that little section is uh, shown more uh, detail on this side of the slide, uh, the right-hand slide. So erasing those, um, we tend to have, as I said, a lot of antenna chlorophylls. Uh, they direct their energy down um, into uh, this part of the molecule. Uh, chlorophyll ends up being uh, where charge separation takes place, and the electrons make their way down through this part of uh, the molecule, while um, the holes, i.e. where the electrons came from, uh, come from that oxygen evolving center. Uh, let's look at that guy in a little more detail. The oxygen evolving center ends up being a cluster of uh, manganese atoms and uh, calcium. Uh, you'd think it a cube of manganese, oxygen, and calcium, um, like with one vertex of the cube being a calcium. And then there's another manganese kind of capping one of the faces. I'll show you that in more detail in a 3D structure. But that's where the water gets stripped of its protons and the uh, oxygen atoms somehow come together. There's a no number of variety of um, hypotheses as to how the, how the oxygens come together. And it basically makes the O2 molecule. Ooh, um, a ligand. Yeah, these things are uh, coordinated by the protein, right? So metal atoms, uh, metal atoms don't just float around in solution naked. Uh, they're very shy. Um, 
what you think of as maybe a copper solution, like nice blue copper solution, uh, is usually a copper two plus ion that has six water molecules attached to it. Usually uh, a common number of things attached to uh, transition metals, especially is six, but it can vary from, um, well, it can vary from um, uh, two to nine, in fact, um, if I'm going to be real pedantic about it, but six is um, the normal number. I'm reminded reminded of something from Monty Python about five being the number of the counting. So, I'm following along on my PowerPoint at home and I'm trying to make sure that I know what I'm going to talk about. Um, so at this point, I can talk about some of the um, some of the structures I've got hit, hidden here, there, and everywhere. Um, let's see. I think way above us, I've got uh, something that I will. Let's see. If I click on it, it gives me a note card. Yay! Uh, let's edit it and make it a bit smaller. Rich. Click, 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 click. I really enjoy giving these talks. I actually double dip because I will be using um, I will be using um, this this talk. Actually, I send my students in my bioinorganic class to watch it as homework. Let's see. Again, I hope I haven't uh, crushed anyone with a uh, protein. There we go. Okay, so that thing. That thing, let's move it down a little bit more. I wish I could do this in real life, like have rhino-sized um, molecules just kind of hovering in front of my students. So um, this this thing is a, um, I would say, a photosystem too from a different uh, molecule. I think this one's from a cyanobacterium. Uh, the black spheres, well, there used to be spheres in Blender, but I got rid of a lot of um, details so I could upload them without crashing the sim. Um, the black spheres are carbon atoms, red are oxygen atoms. Um, green is magnesium. And in the center of this, maybe I can rotate this so that the chlorophyll unit faces front. Well, since the chlorophyll is actually buried within, kind of harder, harder to see. Okay, that's that's not bad. Um, if you um, if you pan in on the chlorophyll, the green atom uh, surrounded by four blue atoms, those are nitrogens. Uh, you'll see you'll see the actual chlorophyll. This is an antenna chlorophyll, um, and um, it's actually got antennas around it. The um, Most of this kind of um, uh, black and red molecules, that's your beta carotene. And beta carotene um, has a lot of those double bonds. It makes it like a wire. Um, Ends up funneling energy towards the magnesium or towards the uh, chlorophyll sites, um, which then is used um, by uh, the rest of the photosystem too. So, yay! Um, one thing you'll notice. Let me move this guy out of the way. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, edit, and then back up into the sky with you. Back, I say. There we go. And I'll make sure he's high enough so that he doesn't interfere in any recordings. OK, so um, one thing that you'll notice is uh, um, similarities between things like heme. And here's a molecule of heme. I'll bring it to the f uh, front in front of the screen. Um, heme is found in your blood. Heme is found in hemoglobin. Heme is found in your liver in cytochrome P450s. Heme is found uh, in plants in photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 as an electron transfer uh, destination. Um, 
Heme is found everywhere. The little brown atom in the middle of the square of the four uh, green atoms, that's iron. Um, heme looks a lot like chlorophyll, but there are some important differences. And those differences have to do with, um, in the lower half of this molecule, uh, you have uh, more double bonds in heme than you do in chlorophyll. Okay. Otherwise, they look structurally very similar. Um, and I've actually got a um, kind of weird looking um, chlorophyll molecule on my other side. So let's, let's move you out of the way and move you back into focus here. Yeah. Okay, so move, move that one up a little bit. One of the things you'll notice on this particular chlorophyll is that um, where the magnesium atom is, I should rotate that. Where the magnesium atom is, and bring you in the front. It's not planar, it's not flat. It's like a shaped like a saddle, right? So where that green atom is, uh, the four nitrogens look as if they're um, in a tetrahedron rather than a square plane around. So that's unusual. Uh, usually uh, the chlorophyll magnesium part is really flat. Uh, um, and that's just that's just one of the like weirdest things I've seen uh, <laughs> recently. Um, the um, it, it kind of shows some of the power of the structural biology. This this these models I show you are from X-ray crystallographic studies. Uh, they are faithful representations of where the atoms actually are in these molecules. They have been measured, uh, right? They're not an artist's conception or anything. They um, have pretty much the validity of photographs of, um, you know, photographs of Mars. I mean, they are the data, essentially. Uh, so, you know, to find, find a uh, structure that's a little bit unusual um, kind of uh, requires, some, requires some explanation. So I have no explanation as to why this one is, is, is weird looking. You will notice that it reminds me of the, um, it reminds me of the um, um, molecular photovoltaic that I showed you earlier in that there's this long chain um, attached to a donor site. In this case, the chain doesn't have double bonds in it, though, so I think it's more for positioning than for electronic purposes. A heme theme. Yeah, uh, I think there's an evolutionary similarity because I think making these um, um, hemes um, is uh, something that's been coded for um, in um, genes, and you know there's a um, um, conservation of um, conservation of genes through generations, especially if they're important for living things, but they can be adapted for other purposes. I think making a heme and then um, adding um, functionality to the heme molecule and then shoving a magnesium in instead of an iron allows, um, you know, is um, I don't know, probably um, an efficient reuse of that machinery. Although I gotta say, um, usually I usually if I say something like that, I'm wrong. Okay, um, moving on with some more. Let's see. I'm gonna move this guy out of the way. Boom, 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 boom. Boop. And hopefully, I'm, yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, so my next slide is there. Click down one. There we go. All right, so here's some structures. I talked about those structures. Um, um, beta carotene. Uh, I think I've got a picture of beta carotene somewhere. Chlorophyll A, I showed you uh, a chlorophyll molecule. I showed you a heme. I showed you the antenna structures. And here's some cats. Uh, these, uh, oh, these guys over here um, passed away.
uh, this was taken about a month ago. Um, and um, they had the window open and there were birdies outside. So, Dad, Dad, there's birds, Dad. And then uh, the, uh, the two little girl cats are um, really looking at uh, one neurotic bird. Um, hey, cats. So, um, photosystem two basically um, uh, takes the electrons ultimately away from water that makes H plus which gets used for things, uh, makes O2, uh, which is a useful byproduct for us. The H plus makes its way to other um, uh, Rube Goldberg machines, we'll call them, um, enzymes. Uh, and the electrons get shunted through into photosystem one. Here's photosystem one. Um, or actually, here's some more uh, pictures that I thought I would share with you. Uh, some of the cats uh, got some tiger lilies. Hey, it's purple and green. And uh, we actually have on my campus a um, calendar, or a, um, it's a, it, it's a it's a um, sundial sculpture. And, and in, during the summer, we have deer that roam around. This is actually right outside the science building. Uh, so. Um, you know, this is uh, <laughs> two minutes away from my office. It's actually quite lovely. Okay, so photosystem one um, doesn't look like my cats. Uh, here's uh, a structure, again, from molecules of the month from a uh, cyanobacterium called, uh, now I have to pronounce it right, uh, Synecococcus elongatus. Um, it's a trimer. If you look at the um, structure. This would be a view from above. It's actually got three repeating units um, that are all pointing in. I was circling that, but um, it's not it's not coming up for me right now. Oh, there it is. Okay. So basically, basically. Yeah, well, that's that's part of one of the trimers. You can kind of see there's there would be three of them. Um, where am I? Next slide. So this is actually what it looks like when it's uh, in the when it's in uh, the uh, membrane. I keep saying cell membrane, but I should say that photosynthesis happens uh, in chloroplasts. So this is um, a membrane that is um, on the chloroplast, which is within the cell, right? So there's going to be um, pH differences inside the chloroplast versus outside the chloroplast. That's going to drive some um, energy storing chemistry. And uh, the cells are small, are, uh, small and transparent enough so that light can penetrate into them to make these processes happen. Okay, so the, the red and blue indicate where the cell membrane go. Uh, it kind of reminds me of an iceberg because there's a um, chunk of stuff that is um, that is uh, kind of happening like within uh, within the uh, ribosome. No, not ribosome, uh, chloroplast. There we go. Here's the business end of photosystem one. Remember photosystem two had manganese in it? Photosystem one has uh, these iron clusters in. And those iron clusters are where the equivalents of electrons get stashed while um, the molecules are waiting for um, uh, light to come in and promote them. So um, we've got let's see, we've got the iron sulfur um, clusters that I've already uh, circled in orange. Um, there's electron transport chains. So these are molecules in gray um, where um, electrons uh, can um, flow towards um, towards uh, the chlorophyll molecules that are uh, in green uh, that um, uh, or, or where the charge uh, separation uh, takes place. Well, notice there's all these little um, green atoms. Each one of those represents the center of um, an antenna molecule that happens to be a chlorophyll. So, 
where are we now? It's slide 31, I think. So if we put all of this together, if we put all of this together, um, we can um, usually find uh, four um, types of uh, super complexes um, in the in close vicinity on the uh, membranes of the ribosomes. Right. So we have a photosystem too. Um, lovely little, a lovely little uh, von von Neumann machine. Right. That acts as we've described. It uh, basically takes some uh, photons. It um, uh, destroys water, liberates H plus, which gets used over here. In um, I haven't really talked about this. This is a cytochrome. Uh, type of molecule, um, and it uses H plus and some of those electrons to um, um, to make some work happen. It um, recharges some of these um, um, NADHs, I think. Maybe it's just flavonoids. Over here, we have photosystem one, which is definitely um, making some NADH, and over here. Uh, we have the ATP synthase, just like the one I talked about earlier. Let's see. I don't always get, I don't always get to circle things for this with this viewer. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, when we think of Rube Goldberg machines, we think of very complicated machinery that makes something simple happen. Well. The simple thing that happens is that we take some um, water and carbon dioxide and rearrange some atoms to make oh something like uh, glucose or some some carbohydrate. Um, but it goes through a lot of uh, steps to to get there, and you know each one of these organic structures, those um, biochemical structures, is a little machine on its own. Okay, so I've uh, I've got just a couple of more things uh, to say. I was hoping to be a little more quicker than I am. Uh, um, from a pea plant. Okay, so on these panels over here, I'll just show you. Uh, let's see. Edit. Let's move them into the metal. They are actually taking up quite a bit of quite a bit of space. Uh, so. For me, I actually shut off my media. Um, these actually show you uh, 3D rotating cross-eyed GIFs. They're stereograms. So let's see. I'm clicking on my media to uh, make make those happen, and uh, it takes a little bit to load. So in the meantime, I will. Open up a file and uh, give you give you some links. Let the while I let those load. So what are we looking there? Well, th these are crystal structures. These are crystal structures of um, the uh, super complex. Um, all of the um, Photosystem uh, two from a uh, pea plant. Let's see, back to... There's only so much RAM in my head, um, so I'm actually um, hunting down, hunting down a document I wanted to share in text on these. Click. Ah, here we go. Uh, so the bottom panel shows the entire protein. So if you zoom in on it, if you zoom in on it and are, um, you know, not too far away. If you click on it, it'll just like um, dominate your whole screen. So, you know, press escape, just zoom in on it with your mouse camera. Um, for some people, not everybody, if you cross your eyes and overlay the images, um, you can see the uh, rotation happen in three dimensions. The very bottom panel is the complete um, protein plus all of the machinery. And you can see how it's put together. Um, the alpha helices, the little pink spirals, kind of, I don't know, they look like hamburgers to me. 
um, they, they basically provide a scaffolding for all of the other stuff to be in the correct position um, to make the chemistry happen. Um, up here in the middle, um, I've deleted all the uh, machinery and just shown you the protein itself. This is one molecule, right? It's uh, one molecule that, like, like, a, like when you're doing knitting, it's basically one strand of um, wool, for example, and it's uh, knitted into all of these shapes. Uh, this means that somewhere in this mess, there is a beginning end and a end end, I guess. Okay? So this is all one shape. And what it does, if you look in the top panel, is it holds, and I got rid of a lot of stuff. I got rid of all the beta carotenes that uh, we, we don't actually need to look at. Um, it has the um, chlorophylls um, plus all of the intermediate stages that you need to get uh, electrons um, out of the iron sulfur clusters to the to the chlorophylls in the photosystem one, I guess it is. Um, the little bright uh, yellow orange dots are the iron sulfur clusters. And you can see there's kind of some molecules that bridge towards where the green dots are. And those are, those are basically the electron transport chain. Um, so let's see. Moving to my next slide. Um, I've got, oh yeah, well, I'm almost, I'm almost done here. Let me move the um, panels out of the way. I guess I've uh, gotten myself hidden behind one. There we go. Um, I made a whole bunch. I made a whole bunch of these um, 3D rotating stereograms. And uh, viewed in Second Life, they're not as interesting um, because you know second life has a little bit of uh, lag to it um, so um, here's links to the uh, rest that i made enter there you go um, and uh, if you open those in something like uh, chrome um, <laughs> some of them are 30 megabyte rotate like single GIF files, so it might take a little bit to open. But if you open them in Chrome, you can uh, kind of see things in a little more detail, and you can expand them. Uh, so yeah, feel free to copy the uh, chat, um, the nearby chat for click. So at this point, I'm going to conclude. Okay, so I um, hope uh, you've enjoyed seeing some structures, seeing some data, uh, kind of getting a sense for how things work for um, in uh, photosynthesis. Um, and um, you know, I want to thank uh, um, you know, students, uh, members of Science Circle, Chantal and Jess especially for everything they do, everyone in the board as well. Uh, thank my students and uh, colleagues and NSF for um, their generous support of my current research. Um, you know, the DPA LLC for hosting my animated gifts that, that I gave you. Um, and all oh, my cats for their patience because I take lots of pictures of my cats. So I, okay, I saw Syzygy ask the question, how exactly are the colors green and purple central to these processes? Uh, it's more of a byproduct. Um, the rhodopsin happens to be uh, purple, uh, and that, of course, is a um, um, consequence of the um, light profile that they absorb. Uh, and actually, you know, I heard once upon a time that uh, in the early Earth, rhodopsin um, you know, under low oxygen conditions, um, was a um, early and dominant uh, photosystem. So it may have been, um, and and I've heard it suggested that it may have been that uh, photosynthetic plants um, evolved to absorb green, or you know, evolved their um, absorption uh, profile because it was complementary to rhodopsin. I, I don't know the validity of 
of this, but I do offer it as an explanation because um, if you actually look at the absorption profiles, the UV vis spectra of these things, uh, there is a complementarity. So the light that the um, rhodopsin using molecule, um, um, organisms uh, wasn't using was available um, as a, maybe an evolutionary niche for the um, plants that uh, eventually came to dominate. So eh, I don't know, um, but you know, that is a possibility. Uh, let's see, zoom in closely. 3D rotating, yes, excellent. Um, and let's see, I've had a couple of uh, messages as well Oops. From, from people. And uh, yeah, um, so uh, let, let me move forward a slide. Here's some resources. Um, essentially, what I do is I take, I use JMOL, um, which is available there. I'll, I'll actually put the links in um, in local local chat. Here we go. There's another drawing of my cats. See, so source for JMOL is that, um, and it's a nice uh, molecular um, drawing program. Um, you can get X-ray crystal structure data for um, biological uh, molecules, um, for inorganic molecules, for minerals uh, from uh, these. Sites. Let's see, um, crystallography.net, small molecules. Uh, uh, Rough does um, more minerals. It didn't come up with everything that I had copied, so let's try that again. Weird, okay. Um, oh, I didn't copy the actual thing. All right. Well, anyway, and I use Blender. Basically, um, basically, I just uh, take um, export the uh, structure from JMOL as X3D files, import it into Blender, do some editing. Like you can get rid of like if there's a sphere inside a sphere, well, get rid of the inner sphere, um, and then. Um, um, you know, combine all of the objects into one mesh, decimate the mesh so that it's not so big, and then it can be uploaded as a DAE file into Second Life. So, so yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, that's my talk. Hope, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, as always. So, um, yay. All right. Well, um, if uh, if if there aren't many uh, questions, then uh, I'm going to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving because uh, that's happening uh, this week. I get a week off from uh, classes, so I'll actually be uh, traveling for some collaboration next week. And my cats do need well. No, they're sitting there asleep. Although I've got one that was grabbing my foot during uh, during my talk, and now she's inside um, inside this little box that I have next to my feet. Awesome. Well, um, I'm going I'm going to sign off. Uh, I'll uh, tidy up some of these uh, things um, later uh, today and tomorrow for uh, the next speaker. And uh, um, I uh, thank you all for your attention. <laughs>